the building we now call FCC was not always a church. It was originally Kimber Farms, a chicken hatchery founded in 1925 by a man named John E. Kimber. And he also worked as a music teacher in a local high school for several years until Kimber Farms could make a profit. And then he became one of the most progressive chicken farmers in the industry. I heard that he was one of the first chicken farmers to use huge IBM mainframe computers in the breeding process. Now the church we call FCC now was founded by Sherman Williams in 1973 as a church plant from Redwood Chapel in Castro Valley. It was meeting at Mission San Jose High School for a couple of years when one of the members heard that the Kimber Farms property was for sale. I'll let Pastor Sherman tell you that story in his own words. So we're here with Pastor Sherman Williams, a founder of Fremont Community Church. And I remember when my wife and I first started attending, um, hearing the miraculous story of how FCC started. And I wanted to ask uh, Pastor Sherman to share with us his story about how FCC started and uh, some of the years after that. So Pastor Sherman, take it away. Well, thank you, Gary. I appreciate the privilege of celebrating what God's done in the church family called FCC. Redwood Chapel in Castro Valley uh, was a very thriving church. And after it got to be a certain size, I think like 750, they felt that that was kind of an optimal age and they wanted to plant churches after that in different areas here in the Bay Area. And so they planted a church in Pleasanton called Valley Community Church. And then a few years later, they decided to plant a church in Fremont. There were eight families who had been attending Redwood Chapel from the Fremont Tri-Cities area. And so they wanted to start a congregation down in Fremont. And uh, they were looking for <laughs> someone to, uh, to lead the way. And so in 1973, uh, I was commissioned by Redwood Chapel as the director of ministries, uh, along with those eight families. And we started October 21, 1973 at Mission San Jose High School in a lecture hall there. Uh, and we had 72 people who attended the very first Sunday. We uh, just had all kinds of excitement about what was going on before long we rented space across the street at the Fremont Country Day School. So all of our kids' activities were there. We had Sunday evening services, Boys Brigade, Pioneer Girls, and all that kind of thing. We had our first baptism at uh, Lake Elizabeth. Margie Brandt was the first one being baptized. And uh, it just went on and on from there, had all those kinds of good things. After one year, uh, my title has changed because I had come just to be there for one year. And then after a year, they asked me to stay as the actual senior pastor. So just experienced a lot of numerical and spiritual growth. And then we started bringing on staff and uh, it wasn't long before Redwood Chapel made a down payment for us on some property just down the street from Mission San Jose High School. And so uh, we started making payments on that property and uh, we actually put our nursery there. 1977, we started in 1973. 1977, we become totally independent from Redwood Chapel and we have a charter membership ceremony. We still have that document uh, on one of the walls at FCC right now of the 100 members who signed uh, that membership. Uh, actually, we called it the charter membership document. Then in 1978, kind of a really interesting happened. I'd say that, you know, we started church in 73 and the congregation kept growing and, and growing. And before long, the people were saying, oh, we need to find a, a facility uh, of our own. And I'm sitting there because I've come from Chicago. I've come from a Christian media background and I've been involved in some fairly large number kind of situations in ministry. And I've kind of reacted against big numbers kind of things. And I just want to 
I remember saying, I don't want to be on camera on television where nobody knows me and I don't know them, but I want to see eye to eye uh, the people and they, the kind of quality ministry happens when we're just eye to eye face to face. And so I, I kind of liked staying at Mission San Jose <laughs> High School and that the emphasis was on relationships and, and growing in, in the Lord. But my, I had a congregation that was pretty feisty and they wanted a place. <laughs> and without me asking them or anything, they start looking for property. And before long, I find out that they are walking around a property called the Kimber Hills Chicken Farm office complex. It was uh, about, I think, 40,000 square feet of space on nine plus acres there on Mission Boulevard. And um, I'm sitting there saying, these people, what are they doing? You know, normally, let's face it, normally the, the lead minister, the senior pastor is the one who's saying, come on, you guys, let's go, let's find this, let's do this, let's, you know, and I'm the last guy kind of at the end of the parade, and week after week after week, they're praying that God will give Fremont Community Church that property, and I'm sitting there as a former businessman saying, you don't understand, folks, this is prime property, property in Fremont, we're this little congregation we cannot afford that in a million years and oh we're praying that god will do a miracle well one of the faithful families in the congregation at that time was ed and gay sheffield and their kids and ed was a sunday school teacher uh but he also was an actual teacher in the public schools but he was a, a gifted uh, entrepreneur and he had the gift of giving and just about the time that a lot of the congregation was walking around Kimber claiming it for Jesus he somehow was led Ed Sheffield was somehow led to resign as a teacher and just kind of go into property development and that kind of thing and he decided he'd take on the, pro the property there at Kimber and say, well, let's see what we can do with it. And Ed, with his tremendous skill set, his tremendous gift of giving, his tremendous desire to bring honor to the kingdom, started negotiating with this DeKalb Industries, I think it was called, who owned the property. The rest of the property was all being developed and had been developed into residential. But here's this 40,000 square foot property. Uh, what are they going to do with it? And there had been two or three attempts at purchasing that property by different kinds of entities. And the city had all, always turned it down. And so here we were, and we were thinking about doing this, but no way we could afford it. And Ed went to DeKalb Industries, located in Illinois, I believe. And he negotiated what's called a fire sale. A fire sale, uh, most of you probably know, is where uh, some corporation, an individual, sell a property way, way below uh, what the actual value is, but they get the tax credit as if it were sold at the, at the high end. But then they can take all of the deductions that come from that. And so... Ed negotiated his contract for this prime property for $380,000. And that was just beyond us, beyond us. And so here, here are the people walking around Jericho who are just rejoicing, see what God is doing. And I said, well, you don't have city approval yet. You've got a contract for $380,000. I don't know where we're going to get that money, but we also get, have to get uh, approval from the city. So we went to the, to the city to get approval and it was such a challenging thing for the city because they'd already gone through three rejections already on that property uh, that uh, it was kicked from the building department right to the city council, the mayor and the other council people there. And uh, we developed relationships with them. I'd already had a relationship with the mayor but here was the praying church of Fremont Community Church again. And the city 
at the time of the hearing at City Hall gave us a separate room where the large majority of the congregation went and prayed while I and a few others went into the actual council meeting to make our presentation of having a, a school and a church there on that property. They deliberated. It was not an easy thing. There was uh, council members who were opposed to it, council for it because of all the, in fact, the Kimber neighbors got up and said they were opposed to it. How could they possibly have a, a church there? I mean, just think of how Sunday mornings there's going to be all this noise and everything in our neighborhood. And I remember the mayor saying, well, would that be a problem for you? Wouldn't you be at your church during that time anyway? <laughs> and so uh, when it all came and was said and done, they took a vote and we were approved. And I remember seeing on the front page of, I think it was called the Argus newspaper front page that this church gets nine plus acres of Kimber Farms property for a church and a school. And the Lord got, uh, I think a lot of honor right even there that we would be able to get that property for such a miraculous price. And uh, we got a short term construction loan because we were oriented to paying as we go. And I think we, we did some construction and we were able to pay even that short term loan off like in a couple of years. So it was a spectacular kind of thing, but the building was in tremendous disarray. The, the grounds were terrible. And every Saturday for months and months and months, a large percentage of the congregation came and would spend their whole day, including having Kentucky fried chicken every lunch uh, and just renovate the outdoors and the indoors and uh, open up the one area, the little auditorium where uh, the preschool is now and uh, just had this phenomenal experience of getting the facility ready. And then in uh, 1978, we were able to move in there. I'm sorry, it's 1979, February of 1979 that we actually had our first worship service. And I remember uh, not only finishing that auditorium, but also uh, some staff, um, offices and that type of thing. I also remember very vividly that first Sunday in that new auditorium. First time we worshiped there, my wife, Marty, at the piano who, when there was an open time uh, to share, she pulled out the Bible and she says, I think I have a word from the Lord. And um, she read Deuteronomy 6, 10 to 12. And that's that portion of scripture where um, there's all this concept of the Israelites moving into the promised land. And that when you are in the promised land and when you have settled down, please don't forget God's hand in this miraculous way that he has provided this promised land for you. Don't ever forget. I think that was a prophetic word that Marty pulled out of Deuteronomy chapter six and really an important part of our history to remember God's miraculous provision. 1980, we hired Sandy Purchase as the preschool assistant director to assist Janine Stevens, the actual director of the preschool. And uh, we started with seven children in, in January of 1980. But in June, we started developing classrooms for an elementary school. And uh, we started with uh, grades one to three, and then each year added uh, uh, the next grade as we grew and grew that way. I, in 1980, uh, took a sabbatical and uh, came back with greater vision for what God would want to do through FCC had all uh, other significant staff that, that joined our ranks like Glenn Collard and Mark Godshall and Lloyd Miller and a lot of people like that. And then uh, in 1982, after being at FCC about uh, nine years, I resigned and went to serve at Mount Hermon. 
and uh, Glenn Collard resigned as well from the superintendent role. Uh, so Janine Stevens stepped in and uh, took over the uh, whole school as well, as well, and that went really well. 1983, Gene Sealander became the sen senior pastor. And uh, all through that time, a lot of things were really developing that God used in some very powerful ways. Uh, a lot more staff coming and going all through the years. In 1987, Mike Hurt was called a senior pastor. And uh, a couple of years later, he resigned to uh, a call uh, on the East Coast. And uh, so we then were looking for, I say we, I wasn't there at the time, but uh, FCC was looking for a new pastor. And <laughs> I am at that time uh, doing consulting and I am doing some part-time ministry at Redwood Chapel. And one day I get a call from Paul Shell, who was the chairman of the elders at FCC. And he says, hey, could I have a uh, appointment with you? And I said, sure, come on over. So he sits down and he says, so we've gone through a couple of short-term pastorates with Pastor Sealander and Pastor Hurt, but we're wondering, is there any possibility you'd come back? And Marty and I had felt for quite a while that the Lord was calling us back into the pastorate, but we didn't have any idea of you going back to FCC, but we did what uh, you don't usually do, and we went back, 1990, and um, we had uh, wonderful staff. Uh, Joe Lynn joined as a music minister, Janine Stevens, Mark Gottschall was still there. Uh, 1992, we started the Center for Biblical Studies on Sunday nights. Um, my goodness, we just kept going and kept going. Doug Tegner joined our staff, Jack Brandt, uh, Shad Williams. And uh, so we just kept going. And before long, 1993, we were uh, starting uh, to have more space problems in our auditorium. And so we were now uh, worshiping three services every weekend and accommodating the numbers that way. 1994, Soul Food, which was a drama and music outreach production, began several years of outreach as we had more emphasis on reaching out to our, well, to, to the cities that were around us. Brent March joined our staff on the music side of things. And then on 1995, after several years of planning, because here we were, like I said, we were on doing three services and oh man, it was pretty tough on us all. And so we decided we need to fill out this last portion of the property, which was this huge warehouse. The only thing there was four bare walls and then this huge warehouse. And we had a, a couple of uh, rounds to figure out what to call it. We call it the pavilion. And we wanted to build out the pavilion, build a stage and build all the things that we could move into there where we had a larger space to worship the Lord. I remember uh, we wanted to uh, do it all without borrowing any money. So we'd pay as we go. I remember Steve Stevens holding these fireside chats for small groups of 10 to 12 people. And we were in this small room uh, where there was a fake fireplace. <laughs> and he and I would host this and he'd do most of the talking because he was the entrepreneur salesman. And so he just maximized his skill set with his passion for the Lord and his passion for getting into the pavilion. I remember us having these, I don't remember what it was called, but it was this huge event in the pavilion, again, bare walls, but hundreds of people came and just stood there while Steve and I uh, gave a, a vision of what could happen in that pavilion. And of course, again, he did most of the talking and the entertainment, but it was just a highlight that led to us being able to do stage one and build out stage one, which is where we could have our worship services. And then stage two was more offices and stage three was the atrium and, and on and on. 1995, as a result, we moved in to the pavilion for our first worship service, and Dr. Howard Hendricks from Dallas Seminary was our 
our speaker. It was really a privilege to have him there. So we took the small auditorium and converted it to more classrooms. We went back out and developed the quad and all of that kind of things. And then we dedicated the pavilion on November 19, 1995. And again, we did something that had to do with the miraculous way the Lord had taken this congregation to be able to raise millions of dollars and build this out a stage at a time so we didn't go into any debt whatsoever. And so we uh, built a pyramid of memorial stones based on Joshua 4, 5, and 7 where it's, you know, the memory of the Israelites crossing the Jordan River and being instructed to take a stone out of the river and put it on the other side and build these memorial stones as a memorial to God's faithfulness. And so even today, as far as I know, the, that memorial stone pyramid with the names of the different people who gave uh, sacrificially so we could move in there uh, is a thing that we remember. So the miracle of getting that property, the miracle of getting the approval of using that property, the miracle of doing this all it, with, without going into debt. It's just absolutely remarkable. So 1996, we had needed to expand some more. So we did construction on uh, buildings for the preschool. And that was fantastic as we were moving according to the opportunities that the Lord was giving us that way. We opened an atrium bookstore in 1997. Uh, all those kinds of things. We started uh, the kinds of ministries like Lighthouses of Prayer. In 1998, we had our 25th anniversary. And uh, the elder board uh, in 1998 with Doug Chun. Steve Dunn, Gary Louie, and myself. And these were the, the leaders that were moving us forward after 25 years. So we had additional staff that was moved in. Bill Martin, Margie Brandt uh, took on the role of lay mobilization administrator. We adopted the Afghan Tajiks as our unreached people group. Uh, the choir was like 60 people and it was really going well at the same time now. Now we're in the pavilion. We're in this larger auditorium, but we are now in three services and four services. It's getting out of control again. Attendance is reaching a thousand people in our Sunday services. Our school has expanded. So we have 740 students, 540 K to eight and 200 preschoolers, which was the max according to our building permit. I can remember on the night before registering for the next year's school, people, families camped out on that green mall out there off between the building and Mission Boulevard, camped out overnight so they could be far enough in the line up front to be able to get into the school. And we had a waiting list even after that. So, you know, just the thriving ministry that was taking place was just Absolutely, absolutely remarkable. 1999, Tony Boulevard joined our staff and uh, we went on with Ron Spence and Daniel Club and others who uh, just were so faithful. I remember celebrating Shirley Miller, Sandy Purchase and Diane Hurst for 20 years of service at Christian Community Schools and uh, just remarkable opportunities that were taking place during all of that time. 2001, Thomas Mello returned to FCC, this time not as a board member, but as the executive pastor. And uh, we just kept moving forward and kept moving forward. A lot of other changes and analog was started, which was more for the Gen Xers. It went from being called uh, Zion to I think Sunday night or something like that, and then to analog. So we were excited about that. Uh, Sandy Purchase became the, the school superintendent. And uh, we just had a lot of phenomenal things. That's when we started the city reaching cells. 
and all of the encounters on weekends that we took place. 2003, um, I went on another sabbatical and Kevin Hom became the interim senior pastor. And um, we celebrated that 30th anniversary and all that's wrapped up in that. And uh, we're so thankful for all those who even were there in 1973, 77, all the way to the year 2003. So a lot of, a lot of staff who were there a lot of years and so thankful for all of them. And that takes us through 30 years. Um, and that's 2003. 2003, uh, we were continuing to move forward. Uh, and in 2006, it was time for me to take another sabbatical. And I asked Kevin Hom, who had now been on staff for six, seven years, if he'd be the interim lead minister. And he accepted that role and he led very well. And uh, when I came back from my sabbatical, um, I spent a couple more years just discerning how to move forward and was convinced that uh, I needed to hand off the leadership to the next generation. And so I recommended that Kevin Hom become the new uh, lead minister and um, uh, the elders uh, graciously agreed to that. He was presented to the congregation and affirmed to be the new lead minister. And so he took the reins of leadership at FCC, continued to seek to figure out the ways in the next generation of leadership and with the new world of <laughs> the 2000s and how we are to position uh, the church side and the school side and move forward. And he served for six years uh, and went through an affirmation process. And at the end of that, uh, decided uh, not to return. And so uh, out of that, uh, a pastoral search was made and eventually uh, the church affirmed Dave Che to become the new lead minister. And Dave served for a couple of years and uh, then uh, has gone on to other ministries and FCC finds itself now looking for a new lead minister as the elders seek to be faithful in leading in the absence of a lead minister and uh, working with the remaining staff to be faithful uh, here even in 2020 in this incredibly dramatic year at so many levels in our individual lives and in our family lives, our extended families, our church family, our cities, our nation, our world. And here we are still so desirous, just like the beginning, to reach those in our world for Jesus and to be faithful to him and each other as we seek to continue to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ, to build a strong Christian family. Counterculture Christ's way. Thank you, Pastor Sherman. So that's just part of the miraculous story of FCC. There have been many more times that God revealed himself here through the people of FCC and also through the ministry of Christian Community Schools and later Kimber Hills Academy through the teachers and the thousands of students and families that walk through these halls.